Wake Up with Patty Catter. I love the show. I never miss an episode. It's the best. I turn it on and turn it up. Hello, everybody. You're listening to and watching Wake Up with Patty Catter. Today, I have one of the most upbeat guests you can get on your show. DC Glenn, I'm so excited that you joined me. Thank you. Mm-hmm. No oh problem. my goodness. So every time I hear your song, even if I'm in a bad mood, that cheers me up the womb. There it is. I know you have a lot of other songs too, but everybody knows that song. Yep. So that exciting. is a, it's a blessing and a minor curse, <laughs> which I don't mind at all. Right. But it's kind of hard when we're doing shows and we're doing other songs and people are looking at us like, okay, can we get the womp? Right. Uh, so you have to really become a better entertainer overall. Well, and, you know, those are the things that you learn along the way. I love that song, though. I mean, really, you know, for those of you out there listening who a lot of you have been through different things in your life that have been really challenging, I know you can't listen to that song and start shaking your butt. Mm -hmm. (laughs) So so what I want to do is I would like you just to kind of go back in time a little bit. Everybody knows your songs. Everybody knows that you're an actor now. But what about when you were growing up? How was it growing up? Well, let's see. I grew up as um, a victim of child labor, right? Because my parents worked me like a dog. (laughs) Um, My mother had me stemming collard greens and shucking peas as I was five years old. She basically had a prep cook. And my father was like, yeah, I got me a little worker. Wash my car, you know, wash the windows, um, cut the grass, mow the lawn, do the hedges, shovel the snow, clean your room. And I thought these, you know, I thought, this was bad, but it turned out to be the best thing in my life because I don't fear work. And they made us do chores and they gave us an allowance and they had a reward consequence system. It was like, we're not going to take your money, but we're going to take away what hurts you. Right. So if I didn't clean my room, well, you can't watch TV tonight. Oh, well, if you don't go to church today, you can't play football with your friends on Sunday. Oh, you test it once or twice, but then you fall in line. And I probably had one of the best childhoods I could imagine because I've never not known love. And I grew up um, going to Catholic school, Blessed Sacrament in Denver, Colorado, and went to Mashbuff for a year. And then high school went to Manual, which was a public school. And that's where I met Steve in the 11th grade. And we sat next to each other because his last name is Gibson and my last name is Glenn. And Steve had a band. And I was like, ooh, I want to be in that band because he used to play in the quad during um, lunch hour every now and then. And then I worked at the truancy office giving out passes. And down the hall was Dr. Joyce Davis, who directed the choir, Manual Bolt Vibrations. And I was like, ooh, I got to be in that choir. And then our first high school dance, uh, some of Steve's friends DJ at the party. And that was the first time I seen anybody actually DJ. And I was like, ooh, I got to get me two turntables and a microphone, right? And I did all these things. And I graduated high school. I went to California and attended Sac State University. That's where I honed all my musical talents and learned how to make songs. And, you know, we were in the band and we kind of disbanded because you grow older. You know what I mean? When you're young men, you, you know, young people grow older. Everybody goes their separate ways. We would try to come back together, but it was just hard. So eventually me and Steve stayed together. And that was tag team, right? And I honed my skills in college and Steve had moved down to Atlanta to go to the Art Institute. And I came down to visit him and I knew I was gonna move to Atlanta. And I moved to Atlanta. Then I started DJing a club called Magic City Adult Entertainment Club and a regular club club called uh, Club Michaels. And, you know, I actually was supposed to have a job at CNN down there, but I got down there and just realized how good I was through all that hard work, all the everybody laughing at me in the neighborhood, everybody saying, you're not going to do this, you're not going to do that. And when I went to a different environment, I flourished, right? From song making to DJing to networking to business to everything. So basically, it was a little difficult in Atlanta because we had switched genres. 
or, or regions, right? We had switched geographical regions. So the whole hip hop industry basically back then was New York, LA, right? Because when I left California, LA was just coming on with Easy E and, you know, um, all those, you know, those early groups. Because before that, it was the up tempo stuff, Egyptian Lover, Dr. Dre, all that. And uh, when we came down south, it was bass music. And we had heard of some of it, right? But when you got to get down here, you get to hear all the artists that live down here you know, uh, make it. And I knew that we would never get out of Atlanta as stars if we didn't make an up-tempo record. And I went to Steve and said, hey, man, we got to make a bass record. And he was like, I can't make that stuff, man. I love it, but I can't make it. I was like, don't, don't think that. Think Planet Rock or Egyptian Lover, right? Because... To me, Planet Rock is the essence of hip hop because that was one of the beginning songs of the B-Boy era. You know, you had Kraftwerk, Out on the Fish, all kind of records like that, but it was up tempo. So he was like, bet. And he put it together and I'd have to be working on a song uh, called Whoop There It Is. That was basically like a party chant. Uh, Throw your hands in the air, wave them like you just don't care. Stuff like that. And wrote the lyrics. We ran and recorded it, and that night I had to go to Magic City to go to work, and I popped the cassette in, and to this day, that is the biggest response on any record I've ever played, and I kind of knew I had something, but, you know, my hubris was out of control back then, so I thought every record I make is a hit record, right? So I kind of shelved it for a while, and um, then it kind of resurged again, and this is like August 92, then I started playing again in January 93. And at that time, one of my uh, record company reps from Columbia Records was in the house, Alan Cole. And he was like, what is that? And I was like, it's my new record, man. He was like, give me that. I'm sending it to New York. And I was like, ooh, I can get everybody to do it like this because everybody had, all the majors would have record company um, representatives in a region. So they would service the t DJ pool, service the DJs, and service the radio stations. And pretty much every major label is talking to us now, but they don't know what to do with the record, right? And I almost gave up. A lady named Lisa McCall told me, you should talk to Al Bell. And Al Bell is uh, one of the original three sole record companies. You had Motown, um, you had Philly International, and then Stax Records was Al Bell. And the year before, he put out a record called Daisy Dukes by Deuce, and it went gold. Mm -hmm. And I knew, I was like, wait a minute, he might know what to do with this. So I gave him a call, called me back in a week. And um, he was like, hey, brother. And I was like, who is this? Like, Mr. Bell, Al Bell. I was like, oh, I was like, Mr. Bell, let me tell you something. I got a hit record. I've tested it. It's doing just going bananas in this city. You need to sign us. No playing games. Just sign us, man. You, you won't regret it. And he was like, OK. I was like, mm -mm. Nah, <laughs> it's not that easy. Right. He was like. I was like, you haven't heard the record. He's like, I don't have to hear the record, brother. I hear it in your spirit because I am passionate. Right. So, you know, he said, let's agree to agree. And I gave my two weeks at the clubs that I were at. I was at Magic City and Club Hollywood. And then we uh, signed a messed up record deal. And in a month and a half, we were certified platinum. And the rest is history. Man, even when you talk, I just get goosebumps going up and down my back because, <laughs> you know, um, I mean, your voice is amazing. But besides that, you're you can feel your passion when you're talking. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's incredible. Um, could you tell our listeners what's one thing that really stands out to you, um, a trial that you've had and how did you overcome that trial? Well, in life, we have tons of trials. Right. But it's how you handle them. Right. You know, I could go I can go back to when I was a kid. This is what. OK, so basically I define myself as a hustler. Right now, hustler has different connotations. Right. So there are people who call themselves hustlers and they think it's just working this way or working that way. But for me, that started uh, one blizzard, I think, when I was about eight years old. And my dad was like, get out there and show that snow. And we were the only one of the only houses on the neighborhood that had a snowblower, right? So me and my brother knock ours out in 20 minutes. And then we see Mr. Grant struggling next door. And we were like, Mr. Grant, we got you. We did his in 20 minutes. Then we did the next house and just did the whole block, right? And we didn't ask for anything. 
just, you know, it was fun with, with a snowblower because it blows it all in the air and blows it out in the street. So, you know, that next week when me and my brother would come home from school uh, or go to schools, they would call us over. So, you know, a neighbor would say, hey, come here, come here. And they would be like, here's twenty dollars. Here's thirty dollars. Here's that happened all week till the whole neighborhood paid us. And I was like, whoa, you mean telling my parents are paying me five dollars a week and I can get twenty dollars a house. Right. And that's when my hustle started. Then I was addicted to work. Then I went and got a paper route. I couldn't wait to get it. I had a paper route at eight, nine years old. Right. And then as I finished the paper route, got into my teens, I had um, I worked at the A.V., center at um, University of Colorado in Denver, which I used to just wheel around projectors and TVs to the rooms. So when they have class, they could, you know, have something to to teach, you know, teach the students or if they needed a projector, whatever. And then I would go pick them up. And then I started working in restaurants. And that's where I started chefing. And then I did that through um, high school in the first couple of years of college. Then I started DJing in the clubs. And now, now we're cooking. Right. Yeah. And I, you know, all the while doing what I'm doing, hustle, you know, just always hustled. I would sell, you know, when I was in the club, I was always selling something. I always had hustles, right? Hustles are basically tools to get money. Right. So most people have one hustle. I've got eight. Right. Because in my environment that I was in, people are going to steal your hustle. Right. So if they steal your hustle, and then, you know, it might, it's not just one. It might be four people that steal your hustle, but that dilutes the hustle and you can't make the money you used to make. So you better have five or six hustles in the hole. So when they say, aha, I got your hustle. And I'm like, ha ha, you can have it because I've got 10 more over here. Here's the next one. Catch me if you can. Yeah. And by the time they figure out how to use the first one, I'm already two, three down. I'm working three, four hustles simultaneously. And everybody's just looking at me like, oh, he he's a hustler. He makes he makes money like they're so innovative. You just it's, it's all supply and demand. You see what people need. You see what they want. And then you try to provide that service for them. And I'm doing that within the club. Right. So I'm selling mixtapes. I'm selling, you know, black women. It could be hot or cold. But if they get their hair done and they start sweating, which they're dancing and whatnot, then that kind of ruins their hairstyle and they paid all that money for them. So I would have these big Oriental hand fans and I would sell them. I would go to New York and get them for a dollar and sell them down in Atlanta for $15. And you just see all these fans because it would, it would keep their head cool and it worked well. If the air conditioning didn't work as good in the club, they would fan customers, right? And customers would pay them, just come over here and fan me and just blah, 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 blah. And they get paid for that. So and I was getting tips and just all, you know, the strip club was a valuable hustle lesson because it was basically a big pot of money. It's like the game show where you get in that cylinder and the money's just swirling all around. Well, that's a night at the club and you just grab as much money as you can. And by the end of the night, you've got a lot of money, right? Because you are pouring, you're pouring things in and providing the atmosphere for money to come out so you get a chance to grab it all. And I did that for years. And, you know, you ask about diversity, not diversity, but like just running up against things, I would come up with tactics, right? One of the first tactics I came up with is in high school, you know, I, w I always had a job. So people were like, I can't get a job. I've drive, drove around all day. I mean, how many places you go to? I went to four. It took you all day to go to four places. I was like, I bet you I can get you a job in about 10 minutes. And they were like, no, you can't. I was like, go get me the Yellow Pages. I said, where do you want to work? It was like, restaurant? Okay, let's start with the restaurants. Call. Hey, how you doing? Just wondering, are you guys hiring? Okay, thank you. Hey, are you guys um, accepting applications right now? Okay, all right, cool. Hey, how you doing? Um, are you guys hiring? Yeah. Girl, just quit on me. You can get here today. You got a job. Boom. Right? Yes. You see what I'm saying? That is a... Learn, I call it learn how to learn, right? It's not enough to just learn and work and go run around the city and try to find a job. I condense that time because as I get older, time is more valuable, right? So you have to come up with techniques and tactics that you can consolidate time and still achieve your goals, right? 
Absolutely. So, yeah. So it's like fast forward. I'll give you an even better one. Um, you know, we were in a we we've been in a 20 year legal battle over Womp There It Is, right? Wow. And it started in about 97, 98, because the record company went bankrupt. And we got money. We got paid. It was I had a great time. I have no ill will toward the record company. You know, I'm I'm not I was never bitter. I just tried to get my money and tried to sue the record company. Not really sue, but tried to, you know, through legal means come to a resolution about my money, right? And, you know, I thought I had long money. The record company's got long money, right? Mm -hmm. So my long money ended up being short money. So what they do is they deplete you. They, they bleed you, right? And there's several tactics they use to do that. But instead of being mad about it and just growing old and bitter like a lot of artists are, you know, I keep that, I keep that deep down internally, right? Because that's an ego and a pride thing. Mm -hmm. But I said, what can I do during this time? Because another record company bought it out of bankruptcy and they took something they weren't supposed to take, which was the music publishing. Now there's a battle and we're in the middle because they're playing us. Who's the side going to be what? Because we have say in this, right? And I said, you know what? I'm not going to do anything. I'm going to let them battle it out, but I'm going to organize and keep records, basically turn into a paralegal for this whole legal battle because I know I'm going to have my day in court and I want to be prepared for that day. Now, it's easy for me to say that I did it that way. It just kind of happened to end up being that way, right? But as I got better at it, I knew how to go get the, the court cases. I know how to use the legal platforms. I know how to use all these tools to make sure that when I had my day in court, all I had to do was just give them a box and they would know exactly what to do. And I could, you know, I, and it, it just, it worked out wonderful, right? So another tactic, I said, I'm never going to let people take advantage of my money again. So I said, okay, let me learn about finance. 2000. I, I look at CNBC, I don't understand what they're saying, right? Which is, for me, was bad. I was like, I got I to gotta correct this. So started studying finance, learned how to trade commodities and Forex and became a licensed commodities broker. Wow. And I was like, okay, pass the test and everything. And, I, and this is what, this is a learn how to learn tactic too. If you ever, I tell people, if you're going to take a certification or anything, the goal is to pass the test and find out how many times you can take the test. You can take most of the times you can take tests three times, right? Mm -hmm. I failed. The, I failed the first time. I just went in there and just failed it, just so I could go through and scan the test because you know that pressure. It, like they'll give you practice tests, but mm -mm, you got to have that pressure. You know what I'm saying? Practice tests don't don't tell you about pressure. So when you go in there and you you try to you try to pass the test, but you don't really know what you're doing, and you failed the test the first time, but now you know what's going to be on the test. And you can come back and you can study, right? And I studied and I failed it the second time. I got like two points but before I passed it. Third time I passed it. Now I'm a licensed commodities broker. I can go work at any firm in the world, right? Because I'm certified, series three. And I was like, I want to go bigger than this. I want a hedge fund. Because back then, that's when everybody's self-help. That's like Anthony Robbins and Robert T. Kiyosaki and all that was just popping back then. And I said, I want a hedge fund because I kept hearing hedge fund, hedge fund this, hedge fund that. And I was like, I could do that. I don't know nothing about a hedge fund, but I could do that because I know all the athletes. I know all the entertainers. I know everybody in these streets. If I become good at this, I can control money and help people get more money. It was a more, let's help everybody come up and not go through the things that I went through. Right. And, but I don't know about a hedge fund. So I started calling just like I did with the jobs, started picked up, picked up the phone, start calling hedge funds. Like, and this is the only time I use the fact that I'm DC, the brain supreme of tag team. Cause nobody, I never tell anybody I'm very, I show, I show more humility than I should according to a lot of people. Right. But I know that that is the way, right? So I call people, I call these hedge fund managers and I'm like, Hey, how you doing? I've got a fund that I'm about to put together and I was just wondering if I could get a meeting and uh, well, what's the name of your firm? I was like, well, I don't have a name yet, but you know, I'm an entertainer. My name is DC Glenn. Uh, you might've heard the song. Whoop, there it is. <laughs> I'm tag team. And they're like, yeah, I've heard of that. Hold on. Let me put you through. Right. 
then they'll probably go, hey, you know that song Whoop There It Is? The guy from Tag Team's on the line. He wants to start a hedge, he wants to manage, wants us to manage a hedge fund. So now I've effectively set up meetings in New York, LA, San Francisco, and Vegas. And the first meeting I go to, I fly to Vegas, and I'm in this boardroom with these hedge fund managers, right? Knowing nothing about a hedge fund. And I'm like, why should I let you guys run my fund? Because, you know, I got Deion Sanders, Dominique Wilkins. You know what I mean? I got TLC. I've got all these artists in Atlanta and I want to manage their money. But why should I let you manage the hedge fund? Because I got to understand, you know, what you bring to the table. And they went into a, 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 a spew of just, we do this and this and that. And this. They were just passionate about it. And learn how to learn tactic from DC to brand Supreme while they're passionately pitching me. They don't realize they're teaching me. Right. And by the time I finished with all of me, I knew exactly what a hedge fund was. And it was too risk. It was too much risk for me because to me, it was basically intellectual gambling. Yes. And I knew that I'm terrible at gambling because I get emotional and you know how they'll drop a bomb somewhere and then there's collateral damage, right? That's the bad side of it. Mm -hmm. Sometimes we do things and you have to, I call it collateral sprinkles. You have to look at the good things that come of it. And I tell people this all the time, year 2000, I didn't know what they were talking about on CNBC. 2002, I knew everything they were talking about on CNBC. So I effectively put myself in a position and never get taken advantage of financially again. And at that same time, I'm on the self-help kick. So I start running my life like a corporation. What better way to practice a business than make your life the business, right? You do that first before you start a business. And what has happened over the years is that my business, my business is CLG Investment Inc. because I was trying to do a hedge fund back then. But now I do so many other things, but it's still CLG Investments Inc., right? Because that's my life. And my life involves so many different things. So basically I'm a consultant and I, I could be a consultant for the music industry. I can be a consultant for SEO. I'm a consultant for finance. I'm a consultant for all the things and all the tools and all the hustles that I've acquired over my lifetime. And now all of those hustles, you know, People say, used to tell me, DC, you're all over the place. You, you just, you got tentacles everywhere. You got to pick one thing. I heard it all the time. And they were like, you're just doing too much. And I'm like, okay. And then people will say, you know, jack of all trades, master of none. And I'm like, I just don't buy into that, right? Because if I'm doing this, if you live long enough, you hustle hard enough, and you educate yourself long enough, all those hustles become one. Yes. <laughs> and they serve you, mm -hmm. right? They serve you. And some of those same trades that people are saying, you can't be this, you become masterful to some of those trades. You see what I'm saying? Absolutely. Now, and, and, just like the, and that goes back to living your life like a corporation, because now I have my accounting department. I'm a bookkeeper because I had to learn how to do, I had to learn how to do accounting. I had to learn if I, if I, I couldn't find somebody to do my bookkeeping the way I wanted it done. Right. So I had to learn how to use QuickBooks. And now I know where every penny is. I know, I know how to do everything I need to do to be a book, good bookkeeper and give my tax people my books and they know exactly what to do. It's almost like the, you know, it's, it's, it's that organization to where you give them the opportunity to be creative. Right. And that's the key. And, you know, all during this time, this is like 2004. I'm just waiting. Right. Cause our, our career got stalled and I'm like, you know what? I'm DJing in the clubs and I start just thinking I needed more. And 
I said, what can I do? And I remember reading this book. I can't even remember. I wish I could remember it. But it's about a guy who wanted to start a pie company. And he went and got a job at a pie company, you know, a pie store. And he called this process, if you want to do something, you got to get in the corridor. That's what he calls it. Mm -hmm. So he starts the pie company. Then he learns how to make the pies, what goes into it, all the things like that. How you order, who you order from, put, you know, take in the orders, you know, order. And he quit and he opened his own pie shop. Then he had his own pie company. Then he franchised it. Then he sold it for $20 million. Right. And see, after that, that was my mindset. I'm like, if I'm in the club, what can I do? And I was like, do the marketing for this club. Right. Cause it's a lucrative club, but do the marketing. And, and the owner's a beautiful lady, Terry Fisher. And she, and, you know, I, I said, okay, I'm going I'm to put together a business plan for the marketing to do the marketing. And I thought business plan was just, you write a little synopsis of what you're trying to do thousand times more than that. You know what <laughs> I mean? You have to know projections. You have to know your costs. You have to know it break, broken down. You have to come up with scenarios. You have to come up with different things. What goes wrong? What goes good? And it took me six months and it was brutal, right? Because I don't know nothing about this, but you know, I had good people behind me. Uh, Jim uh, Williams at American American Business Development. I had met him just to get my credit right. Cause I wanted to learn everything about credit. Cause I knew credit was important, but I had never been taught about credit. And I was one of those people who they had, you know, credit day at the university and they laid out all the tables and be like, you can get free money. Right. And <laughs> didn't know what the interest rate was. None of that. And I learned. And not only did I learn that he taught me how to put together a business plan. I put together a business plan. I go buy a projector and a screen and I'm sitting there, you know, I started, you know, going into my pitch and had a PowerPoint presentation and she was so impressed because this is a club, right? This is not a corporate boardroom. She was so impressed. She cut me a check for 25,000 and said, get started. Then I'm going to pay you for this, this, and this, right? And the lesson of this story is that, I'm not just a DJ. I'm your sound guy. I am your light tech. I am your marketing manager. I do the voiceover for your TV ads. I do the voiceover for your radio ads. I cut your TV ads. I cut your radio ads. I'm your fashion photographer. I'm your videographer, right? I do your calendars. I do your flyers. I go to your meetings. Now you trust me with your company. Now I'm more than just a DJ. You have to make yourself and valuable. If you're in a dead end job and you're like, I hate this job, you're looking at it wrong. What can you do to make yourself invaluable? Because if you're invaluable, you're going to learn everything and how that company works. And you're going to get, you're going to bear the fruits of it because you're doing more than anybody else. It requires that you do 10 times more than your colleagues. But in the end, you can go anywhere you want because you know how to be invaluable. You know how to come in and take over, right? Because you know, everybody's going to be mediocre and just do the job. They're going to be cogs in a machine and you want to be the machine, right? So that has always been my approach with everything I do. And now I'm doing all the marketing and all the things that I just said, but now I like the things I just said. So now I'm like, I want to get better at voiceover. So 2008, I started taking voiceover lessons. I started flying to New York, LA, you know, all over the place. And then I get disappointed because it's not going so well. It's hard, right? And this is part of kind of keeping control over your emotions. I'm thinking, hey, I can whoop, there it is, my way through anything. And I was sorely mistaken, but I didn't give up. I just let it be hard. You know what I mean? And you know, going back to tag team during this time, I now know that we have a forever hit record. I know we now forever have an evergreen record because I am sitting in the movie theater and I'm watching Will Ferrell dance on a table to my song and didn't even know, right? That burned me up because I'm like, how are they going to make a deal and don't even tell me, right? <laughs> yeah. That irritated me. Now, that's something that really irritated me, but I learned about it, right? And every time that that happened, I learned that I could go and I could challenge it, right? Not legally, but I could challenge it through SAG. I could challenge it through these organizations that 
make sure you get taken care of and make sure that you're never taken advantage of. So I would do that. Whenever I did that, the people on the other side knew that I was formidable, knew that I was wanted. So then they started communicating with me and it still burnt me up because it's like we couldn't make money off of what was ours. Yeah. And that went on for years. It went on for 20 years. Right. Still made money, though, because I didn't cry over spilt milk. I knew that it was my responsibility to make my own money. That's where hustlers come in. Right. That's where all those hustles come in. How can I make money? I got a forever hit record. How do I make money off of them? There it is. You do shows, we're doing halftime shows, NBA. We're always making money. We still get a royalty check because there are parts of the contract we did that were right, you know, and I've had a good life, right? It's been fun for me. But the other side, back to these hustles, I'm training for voiceover and these things start presenting themselves to me. I, I became, anytime I want to learn something, I go to the best person who could teach me. I wanted to learn retouch and learn retouch. And I wanted to learn photography, learn photography. Wanted to learn how to do all these things that I learned. And 2011, I get a call at work. And like, DC, lady want to talk to you at the front door on the phone. I was like, which one of these girls I'm messing with done? <laughs> Went crazy calling me at work. And I was like, take a message. Like, nah, she won't get off the phone. I said, all right. Went to the phone. And I was like, look, I'm at work. Please call me in the morning. Gave him my number. And it happened to be a reporter from the New York Times. And she was calling me because Gawker had put out an article that Barack Obama, you know, the president of the United States was in the Whoop There It Is video in his youth. Right. Because they had one what? frame of this rapper who was in Deuce. L.A. Snow looked exactly like Barack. I mean, exactly <laughs> like him. Right. And the whole world blew up. Because back then they were trying to find anything that they could use against him, right? And I'm doing <laughs> interviews all week. Stephen Colbert, Jeannie Most from CNN did a segment. And I realized that in the end, I was, I was upset and disappointed because I couldn't take advantage of that situation. I left money on the table because I didn't have a presence out there. It's not enough just to be tag team. Whoop, there it is. We're in a whole, we're a decade and a half later, right? And I vowed that that would never happen again. And I started search engine optimization, SEO, and learning how to build websites while I'm in the corridor at the club. So I build the club's website, get all the SEO right. And we're just, it just, it's just working, right? And I'm telling you, that was one of the best things I could have ever done. And it was equally as brutal. Right. And around this time also, you know, when, when the whole for 10 years, the old record company was trying to get a venue to have a trial, but to even have a trial, you have to file a motion and then they have to accept the motion. And now, you know, and you got to go from courthouse, circuit courthouse, you got to find a circuit court all over the country that will take that case. And they probably went through 50 motions before they finally got their case. They finally went to trial and the old record company prevailed. And then once, once that happens, that starts a string of um, appeals, right? And the record company that got it out of banks, Rupsy appealed and appealed and appealed and every appeal got knocked down. And the last appeal was to the Supreme Court of the United States. Can you imagine, you know, here on the news, Supreme Court today takes on the tag team case. So whoop, there it is. I was like, oh my gosh, but wow. it, it didn't, that wasn't going to happen. Right. But just the fact that it's documented that that's what happened. Right. And, you know, when all the appeals were over, it was over. And then it became like a, it felt like a scorched earth policy. And that's when we got drew in real tough. And at this time I had retired from DJing because I just didn't want to be a 50 year old DJ, the clubs, had changed. I love DJ. I've been doing it since I was a kid, but it was time to move on. Right. So I, um, it was just, you know, whenever you switch careers, whenever you try something new, don't fight it. It's terrifying. Point blank. It's scary. It's horrific. It, it, it is one of the hardest things you'll ever have to do. But if you're that miserable where you were at, you could be more miserable a little bit, long, a little bit longer and it gets better. Right. 
And everybody asked me all the time. And, you know, I kept up with voiceover and I kept grinding and grinding and grinding. And in 2017, we had our day in court and it was, um, I had to find a lawyer and I couldn't find a lawyer, but I found a lawyer and she was magnificent. And I gave her a big box of discovery all the way back in 1998 wow. organized filed perfect and that saved me 50 percent of the cost of what i would have got charged and because it was so organized they came up with several scenarios to win our case and we prevailed right and it was at a cost but we still prevailed and now we're free Right. Because being under that cloud, if I had made a record and it blew up, I still would have had problems because then they would have both been trying to come after me. Right. And then that would have just stopped me. And then that would have really pissed me off. Right. So I just didn't deal with it. I dealt with what can I do other than this? How can I prepare my life? You know, it's been a it's been a journey. Right. And after that happened, you know, I got depressed. I mean, I laid in bed for. I laid in bed for a month. It was the uh, August 19, August, what was it? August, 2017. And I was just like, what are you going to do? What are you going to do? What are you going to do? Just kept asking myself that question. Watch TV all day. Just couldn't figure it out. And I got a call and it was from this company. It said, DC, we really like your voice. And we got a $10,000 job for you. I was like, cool. I know what I'm going to do now. Right. And not giving up on voiceover had gotten me this far. Right. And, you know, now I am, you know, I'm building the website for tag team. I'm, you know, really engaged. And I said to myself, I want to start doing shows. I want to go on tour. Here's another learn how to learn tactic. Every promoters, you know, I'm starting a network. Every promoters tell me, well, you kind of don't, you only got one song. I was like, yeah, but it's won't there. It is. Duh. It's like, no, you only got one song, so it might be hard for us to get you show. Everybody gave me every excuse why they couldn't help me instead of just giving me one excuse or one reason why they should. And when that happens, I do. This is my best, most favorite go to learn how to learn tactic. I joined an organization, society or an association. Organizations, organizations, societies, and associations are places where people of unique profession start a group and they help people that want to be a part of their profession and they help bring light to their profession and they help, you know, nurture and build their profession to something they want, the division that they have collectively. And they make it better. They stay up with the times. They give you resources. They do all these things. And that's my go-to tactic now. If you say no to me, okay, let me find an organization. I joined the International Entertainment Buyers Association, IEBA. And I realized I can cut the middleman out. And, you know, there's a hierarchy in concerts, right? You have your buyer, top of the food chain. I want to do a concert series. Then you have your venues, the stadiums and, you know, the amphitheaters and, you know, any place you have a concert. Then you have your big boy promoters, Live Nation and um, Our Heart Radio places, you know, entities like that. Then you have your mom and pop promoters, which are the people who are telling me, eh, you only got one song. Then you got your managers. Then you got the artists. I effectively cut out everybody because I went to their convention, 5,000 strong. Me and Chubby Checker, the only black dudes in there. Oh my gosh, I love him. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And I'm wearing a big t-shirt. Whoop, there it is. Just a billboard, right? And I'm now I got cards and I'm just networking and I know my pitch. And I just start introducing myself. Like, how you doing? My name is DC Glenn with the group tag team. Might have heard the song Whoop, there it is. Duh, I've heard of that song. What are you guys doing these days? Well, we're on the road. We got a clean 90s nostalgic rap show. Now, if I'd have said, yeah, well, you just we got a rap show that we're doing out there, they would have been like, oh, no, 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 rap music, no, no, no. 
but I said clean first. When I said clean, the ear, I, I, I see their ears perk up. You know, it's, 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 the, it's the words that you use. They're important. Clean. 90s. Nostalgic. Right? Rap show. Now they're comfortable. Now they're saying, wait a minute. So the very thing that was my weakness to all these mama pops is now my strength to the buyers because the buyers have more flexibility. And if they're looking for an act that they can infuse energy or confuse or just want to have start off or you need an extra act, it's us. And now I'm getting calls for casinos. I'm getting calls for charity events. I'm getting calls for fundraisers. I'm getting calls for hospitals. I'm getting calls for rodeos, state fairs, corporate gigs. Now we're cooking. Then the promoter who worked with us the best, he gets me, he gets us 15 shows on a tour. So now I've gone from effectively doing five shows a year to doing 30 shows a year. Learn how to learn. All because I joined the organization. And after that, I'm, I booked that voiceover gig. Now I'm with my coach because I found a coach in Atlanta. So I train all the time. She's like, you need to go to the People Store Agency in Atlanta. They called me and they're looking for African-American talent. I said, I got the perfect guy. I go to the People Store. They, they put me on their roster immediately. So now I'm on the rosters for all kinds of concerts, uh, promoters. And now I'm on the roster of the biggest agency in the Southeast for voiceover. And the reinvention continues and I start booking and I'm up at the people store and I'm telling them, you know, I, I asked the question, I was like, Hmm, do you guys do, a, um, I want, I was thinking about doing some extra work, right? Just extra work to get on set, you know, for, for movies and stuff. Cause it was all, you know, that kind of intrigued me. And it was like, no, no, we don't do that. Right. And then the owner walks in, introduces herself to her and she's like, I love your face. Hey, put him on camera, right? Just like that. Something I was interested in, the universe came back to me and just threw me in the deep end of the pool. Now I'm an actor, right? I'm like, what I got to do? You got to get headshots and you got to go to class. I go to my first couple classes and it got good to me. And I trained every day. I was in a class in Atlanta and in the South and all, just all over the country, wherever I could find a class, I was in it sometimes two, three times a day. I would do every intensive where LA coaches and New York coaches would come and have a whole weekend where they would just tell you the whole, everything they know. And then I even, be, you know, this is another hustle tactic. I befriended all these coaches and now I'm in class an hour early, helping them set up their lights and their camera. Now, if they come into town, I'm like, let me record your uh, intensive. And then, you, you know, I'll, I'll give it to you nice and neat and you can have promotional material. And for your intensives and make more money and I can have your craft and what you teach at my disposal. And I did that all the way to the pandemic. And it's beautiful because I was booking little regional stuff and, you know, I was having my little milestones, but they weren't the big stuff. And right before the pandemic, I think it was January, no, February, 2020, I booked a national pizza hut commercial. And I was so happy. It was for March Madness. And then the pandemic happened and I lost it. Right. But I didn't, you know, I didn't cry over that $60,000 I lost. I, I was like, they booked you for a national commercial. Everything is possible now. Right. Because I didn't quit. I played offense, kept it moving and just worked my butt off. Right. And you know, the, the, the pandemic was, very, you know, I look back on it now and it's the greatest thing that ever happened to me because, you know, despite all the other stuff, right? Because I lost people. Everybody lost. We all, all, you know, we all had to stop at the same time. And sometimes when you stop, you know, you think you're driving. Like everybody's like, I'm a hustler. I'm a this, I'm that. And you look outside, you drive and you're like, you're revving the engine, but you're not going nowhere because you're stuck in mud. Your wheels are spinning. You're hustling, but you're not hustling. You're, you're, you're not getting anything from it. That wasn't my case, but I, I could see 
how that could happen to a lot of people. And I said, you know what? What are you going to do? Same thing when I was depressed. Can't do shows. Can't do this. Can't do that. They're not going to open up for this. They can't do this. But you can do this. Right? And I said, reinvent. I reinvented myself with voiceover. And every voiceover class I ever took, any acting class I ever take, I have it recorded. And I went back to the first class I took for voiceover when I went to Joan Baker and Rudy Gaskins in uh, New York. And it was the most heartbreaking thing I ever listened to because I had to listen to my 10 year ago self (laughs) have conversations, right? Mm -hmm. I had to listen to my first voiceover script that I read and it was just (laughs) gut-wrenchingly cringeworthy. And oh my God. I am so I was so terrible, but at the same time, it was inspiring because my hubris led me to believe that it was their fault. They weren't teaching me right, but it was my fault because I was getting in my own way because I wasn't listening. And it's not that I wasn't really listening. I didn't know the language. Same thing with CNBC. Didn't know the language, but because I didn't quit. I kept training. I went through the most heart wrenching part of it and then started taking acting lessons because they're kind of one and the same. You learn things from voiceover that you take to acting and things from acting you take to voiceover. Wait a minute. I get what they're saying now. Let me do this voice. Let me do this first script over. And I did it. And it was angelic (laughs) because that was the first time in my life that I had mastery over my voice. The voice that you said. 30 minutes ago gave you goosebumps. I have mastery over it now. And not to say that I'm a master of it, but it's like I have a certain mastery of it where I can now, I feel good about it, right? It's not a chore to me anymore. And I started booking. And that was back a March a year ago when everybody thought we were going to turn to zombies and start eating each other's ears off, (laughs) right? Yeah, hey, 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 it felt like that in the air. It felt like <laughs> this is how those movies start. <laughs> it did. Somebody starts running crazy. Like, why are they running so fast? And then the whole bunch of other people like, wait, that's what it really felt like. That's true. Yeah. It felt like that in the air, even though we knew that wasn't going to happen. But it was that scenario. And mm-hmm. I just for the whole month of March, I reinvented myself. I went through 42 hour sessions, I organized all that stuff. And. Then the month of April, I get a call from my L.A. acting coach, Crystal Carson. She's like, I'm casting this movie. I got a part for you. And she's like, can you get to Nebraska? I was like, yep. I got a hazmat suit and flew to Nebraska. And we shot a movie called My Corona about living in the age of My Corona when it started and just what we've gone to that to that point. And then not only was it a movie, we shot a documentary about shooting a movie. Wow. So it's like I'm in a documentary and a movie, my first. Then two months later, I get a call from a producer like DC. Do you got this, that, that? They would call me on something totally different. And they're like, well, yeah, I'm putting together this movie. Hey, we start talking to their assistant. Put DC could be de- de- uh, Detective Thompson, right? He'd be perfect for Detective Thompson. Got my second movie in a pandemic. Go to the middle of Georgia, we shoot. And then I book a holiday Publix commercial for the shopping chain for voiceover. And then I book a Tyler Perry uh, House of Pain episode. Oh, man. Then that's a, and then here comes Geico. Right? Mm-hmm. And this all this is all the culmination of everything I've been telling you through this whole podcast. Because 10 years ago, when they thought Barack Obama was in our video, they couldn't find me. And back then, if you typed in tag team, it was all wrestling, right? You type in tag team, Google is all wrestling. You type in tag team today, it's all tag team, right? And my agent calls me and says, Geico booked you for a commercial. They want you. I'm like, don't play with me. I didn't even audition for Geico because I'm really confused about this. And I'm like, she said, no, DC, 
Geico said they wanted tag team for their commercial. I was like, oh, tag team. Forgot about them, right? Because I'm in just, I'm in mindset mode of how am I going to survive, right? And I, look, I check my tag team phone because we got a phone that's connected to the website. And lo and behold, I got a call from Geico. And I missed that call. They went to my actors portal on IMDb because I am because I fill out all my profiles perfectly. I know SEO. I've laid incredible breadcrumbs throughout the universe to be found. They found me and they called my agent and I let my agent make the deal because this is synergy. This is what they do. They do commercials and movies and all that. If I book, they're the ones that negotiate for me. Now I don't have to get lawyers. I don't have to do all these things that I would have had to do. I would have had to contact the record company and the record company would have been licking their chops because they might've been looking at me like we can take advantage of this dude like when they were kids. Yes. And it didn't happen that way. And I let my record company make the deal. And it it has been the most lucrative deal I've ever made in my life. And everybody's like, DC, I know you're happy. You got a Geico commercial. I was like, I was happy for the first two days. But then I know I had work to do because we're in a pandemic and I'm an actor. So as an actor, I'm not going to just walk into this. I'm going to prepare for this, even though it's a commercial, even though, you know, that's how I booked the Pizza Hut commercial. I changed my auditioning approach. And that auditioning approach also works for onset approach. You, you build you build up five scenarios, six scenarios that you can put in your pocket. And when you put them in your pocket, you just hope that the director says, well, Show me a little something different. Let me see what you got. Or they'll tell you, do this and do that. We're going to do a take. And we just kind of want you guys to freestyle. Right. And it was this uh, beautiful actress. Uh, her name is Kia Mahat. And that's how we booked the Pizza Hut commercial. Because they let us do our flow. And I pulled out stuff from my pocket I had prepared. And it was easy. I did the same thing with Geico. Geico. They were like, it was supposed to be soup. There it is. And I was like, man, I'm going to prepare for that. So I'm watching, you know, Seinfeld episodes, the soup Nazi trying to figure stuff out. And they're like, no, 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 no. We're going to do, we're going to do a scoop. There it is. Ice cream. And it was so special for me because I had lost my dad about three months before the pandemic. And it was glorious though. But it was, it was perfect because the essence of that commercial took me back to him because he used to make ice cream for us when we were kids. And he would get the eggs and the sugar and the vanilla and the milk. And he'd be like, oh, go get it ready. And we had an ice cream churn, big wooden barrel with a silver cylinder. You put ice around it with ice crystals with uh, salt to make make it colder. And then my brother would turn and then I would turn, right? And in 20 minutes, two little kids got ice cream. They're just eating it out the cylinder. And I wanted to bring that essence to the Geico commercial because that's what we do as actors. We try to find things in our past that we can transport ourselves back to, right? And then that helps. And it was, um, you know, I wanted to make a spin and scoop. And I was like, I got to find somebody to fabricate a spin and scoop. I'm going to little shops and stuff. I'm like, I'm just, I can't do that. I'm like, man. And I was like, all right. And, you know, I, I know kids love sprinkles. I don't know why, because sprinkles are nasty. But. I know. <laughs> but as a kid, kids love them, right? And <laughs> I said, we got to have a bunch of sprinkles. So how are you going to do the sprinkles? Well, we could do the salt bay. I was like, yeah. So that tried to do salt bay. We could do, oh, LeBron James when he goes to the table and does the chalk. Sprinkles. Make that sprinkles. And then we have a sprinkle food fight. We could do all kinds of things with sprinkles. Cool. And we got a little dance we do down south where everybody in the region would know that we represented the south. And then we just collaborated with all the other actors. And they... You know, they were fans. And then Nikki, the mother, Tasha, she was a hip hop dancer back in the day and knew every single dance. And we did that commercial. We had our production meeting the night before I went to the director. I said, hey, man, can we do some things? And he was like, do anything you want to do, DC. And I was like, cool. I tried to get a spin a scoop, fabricate a spin a scoop, but I couldn't find nobody to do it. So we got scrapped. I was like, no, we don't. We'll have it done tomorrow. I was like, it was that easy. All I had to do was tell you. Wow. I had to spin a scoop. <laughs> and everything we wanted to do was shot. And those, because I prepared, 
preparation, preparation, y'all, because I prepared for that commercial, the nuances in that commercial that are most effective are the things that I prepared. Everybody that sees me calls me sprinkles now. It's like, hey, sprinkles. I'm like, hey, man, uh-uh, don't do that. <laughs> but then I've embraced it, right? So we shot it. We had a good time. We danced all day. We had fun. It was incredible. And then the next phase starts. Usually when you do a Geico commercial, you're on tour forever. Salt and Pepper did theirs 2014. They were on tour to the pandemic. We're not going to be on tour because we're in a pandemic. But I could have been, I could have stopped and been happy that I had a Geico commercial. But I was like, no, that's not going to happen. I'm going to take these lemons, make me a lemonade company, franchise it, then sell it for $20 billion. That's my mindset, right? So I, you know, I said, I'm on a publicist. I'm an actor. I'm all this. Let me do this for publicist. You know, we get a publicist. Start going to publicists and they're like, well, we're in a pandemic. We're all working from home. We don't necessarily know how to do this like this. And it's just a commercial and it's usually a movie premiere. We do a junket in New York and or L.A. and it's just difficult. And I'm like, thank you. And they gave me every reason why they couldn't do something instead of giving me one reason why they should. And what do I do when that happens? Join an organization. And I joined the Public Relations Society of America to learn how to be a publicist. I'm going to be my own damn publicist. Yes. Two days in, I'm on a Zoom call with this CEO of this big PR firm. And, you know, we're talking and she's like, uh, I'm like, raise my hand. Hey, I got a press release that I want to drop. And are they relevant still? And she's like, well, what's forward? I'm like, well... I'm kind of featured in this Geico commercial called Scoop. There it is. And I'm looking at the chat. Oh, my gosh. That, is that him? That is a great commercial, dude. I love that commercial. My kids love that commercial. Great commercial guy. Commercial. Everybody's just blowing up the Zoom chat because they love the commercial. And I've taken over the Zoom effectively because now everybody's like, I can't believe he's on here with us, right? And the moderator is like, we'd like to welcome DC to the organization, Georgia chapter. And we're going to talk about that Geico commercial afterward. But back to his question. And the CEO is like, yes. And here's why. Because the whole last year has been about COVID. Every news story, everything, our whole lives have been about COVID. Yeah. Everybody's been fighting. Everybody's been mad. And then here you guys come with a universal feel-good story, throwing sprinkles everywhere and spinning scoops and dancing and smiling your smile, DC. And I'm like, dang, the CEO knows about this? And they're like, drop that press release. And also, you want to do this if you want to get in front of all the reporters. You want to do this if you want to get in front of all the TV shows. You want to do this if you want to get in front of the podcast. You want to do this. You want to make sure your pitches are this. Don't forget to do this. Because I joined the organization, because I didn't quit, because I didn't give up, because I play offense, because I don't take no for an answer. They gave me the whole game on public relations in 10 minutes. And I have not looked back and it has opened doors for me. I could have never imagined. And it has changed my trajectory from this to this. And I use it in every aspect of my life. And it is the reason why you and I are sitting here having this beautiful conversation. And I can't stress that enough, right? Because people think of, of hustle and hard work and the things you do to achieve things as a quit pro quo. If I do this, this better happen or it don't work, right? And you can't look at it that way. You don't plant a seed in the soil, sit down, cross your legs and say, grow seed. I need you to grow seed because I need this money. Seed, if you don't grow, this seed don't even work. I quit. In reality, you don't do that. But we know people who do that in spirit. They do that in their mind. If this don't, if this don't happen this quick, I, you can't do that. You got to just plan them and keep moving. That's the, that's the whole theory of playing offense. You got to learn how to learn. You got to make these hustles one. You got to make them serve you. It's not just to, to learn something to have in a tool belt. Some people got a tool belt. Some people got a toolbox. I have a tool shed that will rival anybody. I'm basically, 
I'm basically I'm basically a Home Deep. No, I'm not home. I'm not that big yet. <laughs> I say I'm I'm say I'm a mom and pop Ace Hardware, right? That's how many tools I have because I've been planting seeds for years, and they've all culminated into a forest of opportunity. That's where I stand right now, and people are sitting here trying to wait for it to come back the way it used to be, and it's not coming back. Because we're, I'm standing in front of a new frontier. Everything is new. The pandemic taught me. Pandemic said to me, dude, all those things you thought were mistakes in your life, all those things you thought were missed opportunities in your life, all them things you wish you could do, all those daydreams you've had, it ain't over. You can still do it. You can correct them. You can make them right. You can do whatever you wanted to do. My goal is to not leave this earth regretting that I didn't do something. So now the pandemic has changed the paradigm for me to be able to accomplish these things. I reinvented myself. Not only did I reinvent myself, I had a big meeting with my agents. They were like, DC, what do you want to do? I was like, I'm beautiful. You guys are the greatest. DC, what do you want to do? What kind of movie roles do you want? What do you need to tell us? I'm good. Whatever you bring me, I'm happy. DC. What is your bucket list? I was like, oh, <laughs> never thought of it like that. And I said, I want to be in the Mandalorian. I want to be in anything Star Wars, Star Wars universe, animation or live action. I want to be in all the Marvel movies since they shoot them down here in Georgia. Started like audition. They're like, we didn't even know you wanted to do it. Hey, I told Steve, I said, I want it all. Right. So. All these opportunities I thought I missed. I'm sitting in the office with New Line Cinema president. He's telling me, hey, we might want to cast you for this. You know, this movie we're working on right now, we got LL Cool J and Denzel, not Denzel, but uh, uh, Wesley Snipes. It's between them, but I, I think you might be good for this. And I'm like, cool, whatever. Right? Because I didn't know what I, I, didn't, I didn't even know. I'm thinking I'm whoop, there it is. I'm the greatest thing since whatever. Right? Because that's when I was a young man. And I beat myself up for years because I could have been in the movie Blade if I had just listened, right? And, and, and you know, and I was just, I, I beat myself up over, I taught Mickey Mouse and Minnie Mouse how to rap because we did a record called Won't There It Went, Mickey on Rap. We did an album for Disney for kids. And I'm in the deep bowels of Disney with the husband and wife team that play Mickey and Minnie Mouse. And they exposed me to voiceover. and. I exposed them to rap and I taught them how to rap and we made a record. Now that record for me is cringeworthy because we made it for kids and it sounds like it's for kids. Right. But that is an accomplishment because that started my juice of a voiceover, but it was delayed for 15 years and it took that long. But now I've just signed with one of the biggest voiceover agents in the world. So did I miss that opportunity? No, it was delayed. I corrected it through hard work, perseverance, and just steadfastness, right? And, well, I want to be in movies. Well, I'm in movies now. I, my, my actress friends. I'm like, all I want to do is just be, we just talk about acting. All I want to do is just be a working actor. Like, DC, shut up. You are a working actor. I'm like, oh, yeah, I am. So that opportunity I thought I missed way back then, I am that now, right? And the things that I want to do, that I've always wanted to do, I'm training for now. Because half the educators went back to teach the kids in school. Half the educators said, I am not going to be around them nasty ass kids. <laughs> and what they did, they changed their paradigm and they changed the whole paradigm of education because they went and joined all the tutor sites. So now that same kid that they, they would be teaching a class for $60 a day, they're now teaching that same kid one-on-one -on -one $60 an hour. I've got tutors for music production, music theory, video editing. If I have a little trouble in anything, I got mentors. I got five mentors for SEO, right? I, I can, um, you know, I just, I stay playing offense. I'm working on this doll right now to get bit to big, you know, be music production. And I'm being trained by the developer and the engineer of the software every Tuesday, Gregor, right? In Germany, you see what I'm saying? There's nothing that you cannot do. You have to learn how to learn, right? And that all came to a culmination this weekend because my niece 
was on the phone when I was talking to my brother. She's like, Uncle LaBelle, you're you're in you're in the you're in a newspaper. I'm like, what? I didn't even do an interview for it. No. You you had a message for the class of 2021. I was like, oh yeah. One of our classmates back in the day, 80, class 87. I'm class 84. She called me and she was like, you know, do you got a quote or something that you could give these young kids? Cause we just think it would be real special coming from you guys or from you. And I was like, it can't be just a quote. Let me talk to you. Right. And she said, what would you tell your high school self? Right. What advice would you give your high school self? And I didn't want to just be don't quit. No, I was like, join an organization. Because if you, you might go to college, you might not go to college, but if you join an organization, you could learn, you could join an organization, pay that fee, start calling everybody and learn about that profession in two weeks. You have to put in the work, of course, but you can learn about it in two weeks and you know if it's for you or not. And if you have a passion for it, you stay in an organization because those organizations are filled with people who've been doing it for 10, 20, 30, 40 years. And you can effectively have a college education and master that craft and about it's on you how fast you want to learn it. And that's what I told him. It was in the newspaper and it just made me that's what it's all about. Because for me, I just want to talk like I am real. I am so grateful that I'm sitting here talking to you. You gave me the opportunity to talk on your podcast because all I want to do is just talk to people about the things I wish somebody had told me when I was a young man. And my parents raised me beautifully, but my father doesn't know about the ins and outs of snakes in the music industry. I have to learn that on my own, but I've taken responsibility for all those things. And I've come out better on the other side because I don't look at the glass half empty. I look at it as half full. Right. And I am the man today that I am because of it. And my future is bright and not many people can say their future is bright. Like they feel like they're 25, like I can, because of how I think I think differently. I reverse things. I love to be wrong because it's the path to being right. Well, you have thing? been so motivating to me. I had a friend of mine at a mentorship meeting and he was telling me, you're doing too many things. And so when you were talking, everything you said was just going right to my heart because I feel like everything I'm doing, I'm supposed to be doing. And I have those tentacles and they're going everywhere. And um, I love how you brought in your entire story from when you were a child to a teenager to now how all of your entire life has just been connecting and interweaving. And it's made this beautiful design kind of like, um, if you've seen a beautiful quilt all put Mm -hmm. together. Yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah. And that's what life is for me. Right. And I know when I open my mouth, the chance to sit here and talk to you, I've learned so much. I feel like you, my heart is full because I've learned so much because I've figured out different ways, different ideas. While I'm talking, I'm thinking of different ways, different ideas, different ways to do things. I take things and I flip them. Right. Because I love, like I said, one, another reason I love to be wrong is because being wrong stops your ego and your pride. And perfect example, if you're in an argument with somebody and you know these t- you know these type of people they'll argue you down and they'll start making up stuff and they'll start getting irrational and they just start going down a rabbit hole just to win an argument and I just let them go and I'm like all right you're right mm-hmm. but out but they'll keep going and what happens is because you let go and you took your ego and your pride out of it now you're on the path to being right where they're going deeper and deeper in that hole and now that's their reality and it's based in a falsehood. And then they start living their lives like that. And then they can't ever come out of it because they can't sequester their ego and their pride. Women, men, everybody, family members, it doesn't matter. And, you know, the people that are going to hate on you most are the people that care about you most. And it's not that they're hating. Some are, some aren't. It's that they don't know any better and they care about what you're trying to do. So if somebody says, you can't do this, You're doing too much. You're doing this. You're doing that. You're doing that. Just let them talk. Right. Because this is what I do with people now. Every time somebody gives me an excuse, I say, thank you. Because you've just given me an opportunity to come up with five solutions that I could put in my tool shed. You see what I'm saying? People will be like, well, I can't do this because of this. It's like, yeah, you can. All you got to do is this, this and that. 
because what I do now is if there is a problem or if there needs to be a solution for something, I think of the most fantastical, far-fetched, pie-in-the-sky, just the ultimate solution. Now, it might not be based in reality, but it can be based in reality. Is your perfect solution for the problem. Now, you're far from reaching that, but what you do is you aim high and then you work your way back to practicality, what's practical. And then what you've basically done is you've just created a business plan for what, you, what your solution is. So because you achieved this goal, you'd be like, well, hey, I can achieve, what's the next? What's, let's go to the next one. Let's go to the next one. Now you're at, now that fantastical, far-fetched solution is just a solution. And now that problem has been solved. And I do that every day for every aspect of everything that I do. I go down rabbit holes of learning, trying to figure things out. They call me DC, the brain supreme for a reason. And now I know why. You see what I'm saying? And I just want to thank you for having me. Just let me come talk like this because it means a lot to me because I know that God has blessed me with the ability to touch people. I've done it with Whoop. I've done it with this Geico commercial. And now he's shown me another way by just using the gift that he gave me of my, of my voice. The fact that I can sit here and talk and just touch people means more to me than anything. And I just want to thank you. Well, you have definitely touched my life. After the show, I'm going to send you an email of a few mm-hmm. things that you really hit with me. Yeah. So, I mean, I appreciate it. And I got my a guess- ton of them. I can go four <laughs> hours, but I, you know, I got to get back to work. <laughs> I got voiceover <laughs> auditions I got to do this morning. So awesome. I, I get it. I get it. And you just have to, hey, don't ever let nobody tell you you can't do nothing. And just remember the things I said. You got to get control of those, of those emotions, right? And mm-hmm. one thing is I've, I've, I've learned the ability over the years to take any negative emotion, fear, envy, anger, despair, hate, and not react to it, but put it in your pocket. You know, it's eating you up inside. You might get mad. You might react viscerally, but put it in your pocket and use it as fuel for later, right? Because this way you get it out of your system in a positive way. Mm-hmm. So if, I'm, if I, got a, I got an audition for this acting um, audition I got to do tomorrow, right? And it requires me to be a little angry. So now I can think about a conversation with a girl that pissed me off last week. Mm-hmm. And now instead of me trying to find a character or be a character or become a caricature, now the character becomes me. And it's based in reality. And I don't even have to try. That's acting, right? And that's how things, that's how negative things serve you, right? Uh, If somebody hates on you, okay, now I'm going to show you that you're wrong. Not because I'm trying to be spiteful or whatnot. I just want to, It's you know, hate you hating on me. The solution is showing you that your hate was stupid. And all you have to do is, you know, I've been blessed to just when people hate on me, I don't burn the bridge. I say, thank you. And later on, I get to look them in the eye and they know, right? And it, it just, it's basically, thank you. Thank you for hating on me because you're the reason that I was like, oh, oh, hell no. Nah. Oh, you think that about me? All right, let me show you. Let me show you for me, but let me show you because this is what I do. Don't challenge me. I love hard things because I know everybody's not going to try to do it. Mm-hmm. Absolutely. And people, people think, you know, people think there's this special thing. I'm like, no, if you're trying to achieve something like with voiceover, voiceover was super hard. SEO was super hard. All of it was super hard. I would try to find shortcuts, but there are no shortcuts. You can't go around it. You can't go under it. You can't go over it. The only way to it is through it. Yes. Yeah, the only way to it, and you—it's almost like you. People ask me to—I think they're the dumbest questions, but they're valid questions. When I do these podcasts and do these interviews and talk to people, they say, "DC, how do you not give up? How do you not quit?" I'm like, "Hmm, don't quit. You just don't do it, right? You just don't quit. Don't quit." And then it's like I see people's light bulbs come on people's head. I'm like, "Don't quit." 
Mm-hmm. Like, it's that simple, right? Well, DC, how do you handle the fear of doing something new? Uh, be scared and keep it moving. You can do two things at once. You can, you can, that's, that's, to me, that's where the phrase comes from, where they say, you know, you can chew gum and walk at the same time. I can be scared, but I'm still going to do it. Mm-hmm. I can be lazy and not want to do it, but I'm still going to do it. I cannot want to go to gym today, but I'm still going to do it. And the whole time you got, I call him Monsieur Saboteur. Monsieur Saboteur is on my shoulder saying, hey, man, we don't need to do that. Come on, dude. We don't. You can wait till tomorrow to do that. Don't do that, man. Come on, man. Come on, man. Let's go eat. Come on, man. Let's let's eat terrible. Come on, man. Let's, Mr. Saboteur is just constantly at work, just beating me down, trying to make me do things. But it's, you need him because if you do the things anyway, and still, if he's just chattering your ear, you can accomplish anything. But if you mm-hmm. start believing him, you start doing those things. It, it, everything I said today is way easier said than done. Right. But, you know, the difference between, you know, good and great is that, you know, great people is that I don't want to do the same thing. Everybody, you know, I don't want to do stuff that other people got to do either, but do it anyway. Mm-hmm. And that's what takes you to the top. So that's what makes you a real hustler, too. You're yeah, not just tough. Yeah, you just do it. And I'm just grateful. And I'm glad I came today. I'm glad we talked and I got to get out of here because I got to go to work. <laughs> Thank you. What is, what, where's your social media where everybody can find you? All right. So here's the thing. That's what SEO is for. So you can mm-hmm. type in anything about me. You're going to find me. Yes. I made it possible to have all the breadcrumbs. DC Glenn, DC Glenn ATL, tag team. Whoop, there it is. Scoop, there it is. Geico. You'll find me. Yes. And I'm going to share your links too. Thank you again, uh, Mm -hmm. DC Glenn. I appreciate you so much. You've touched my Mm -hmm. life. I know you're going to touch the listeners out there and I am so proud of you. I just have to say, I am really, really proud of you. Um, I love how your life has transformed. I look back at my youth and remember listening to you and some people back then, they didn't come out very good. And look at all the things you're doing. It's just impressive mm-hmm. and very proud of you. Everybody's got a choice. Mm-hmm. Everybody, you got choices in life. And I just refuse to lose ever. And even if I lose, I'm going to get back up and I'm going to try it again. I just had to get to it in a different way. So like I said, you can, all, you can correct anything you want. You're never too old until you're not breathing. So... I leave you with that. Everybody have a good day. Thank you. And I'm out of here. Thank you. Oh, yeah. Sprinkles. Yes. (laughs) Wake up with Patty Catter. I love the show. I never miss an episode. It's the best. I turn it on and turn it up. 